Welcome to not tonight's public lecture. Uh, this uh, series bears the name of Spencer Trask of the class of 1866, who endowed it in 1891. Tradition has molded this originally vaguely worded bequest into a series that emphasizes the sciences. In academia, we are used to some titles. It's Dr. This and Professor That. And it's a refreshing pleasure, pleasure to introduce somebody uh, whose title is The Amazing. Uh, James The Amazing Randy is here tonight uh, because he's a scientist. And he's a scientist uh, not because a diploma says so, but uh, out of necessity and, oddly enough, because he is a magician. Uh, he's turned his profession uh, of fooling people for fun into a life's work of teaching people how not to be fooled uh, by others or by themselves. In recognition of his skill and dedication uh, at this work, uh, he's received numerous awards and prizes. A couple of my favorites, uh, American Physical Society Forum Award, because I'm a physicist, in 1989. And uh, one that's nice is having an asteroid named after him. Um, now he's reached the point where there are awards that are named for him, and uh, he offers prizes. And I will quote from a rather legalistic appearing document you can find on the web that says, I, James Randi, through the James Randi Educational Foundation, will pay the sum of US $1 million to any person or persons who can demonstrate any psychic, supernatural, or paranormal ability of any kind under satisfactory observing conditions. Uh, it's amazing how the number $1 million uh, focuses the mind. Um, James Randi, simply put, is a professional wizard, and it's a pleasure to have him here tonight. Uh, we will start with a, a very brief video showing some of the things Randy's been up to lately, and then you'll meet James Randi. People, I am the amazing Rudolph, and I will show you how easily a skilled magician can reproduce any of these so-called psychic tricks. Forget the chit-chat, get to work. Hi, I'm James Randi. I'm a magician. That is to say, I'm a fake. Watch this. I'm going to do a little trick for you. I'm going to bounce this pen on the edge of the table. Now I'll look away, so you're sure I'm not blowing, but I want you to look right into your TV set, concentrate on it, make that pen fall off the table. Let's work on it now. Come on, concentrate. Stronger. Gee, that was very good. How did you do that? June 7th, we'll be offering $100,000 prize to anyone who can prove psychic we powers can do it? on our program. You're thinking of a pizza, right? No. A uh, small little rodent? Maybe a hat? A hat? No. A uh, clothespin? No, uh, wrong. Uh, a shoe? Uh, Gesundheit. Oh, oh I may have a hammer. No. We're going to get that money. We're going to make that money. We're going to make that money. We're going to get your money, Randy. You're going to be broke, man. Do you believe everything you see on the news? How about a nationally reported story about a computer that determines the guilt or innocence of suspected criminals? Host James Randi, professional skeptic and a bunker of frauds, takes us through the conception, the setup, 
and the payoff of these remarkable scams. I'm James Randi, and in this special presentation, we'll look at the inner workings of some of history's most outrageous scams and the confidence men behind them. Now, most cons follow a very simple set of rules. The first rule is that the con artist always wins. Misdirection. It's the greatest weapon that the magician has and that the psychic has to direct your attention away from what's really happening. And with that warning in mind, we'd like to direct your attention to a man who has directed his attention to misdirection Hold on to that his entire life. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is James Randi. I'm not a chemist. I'm not a physicist. I'm not a medical person. I'm not a geologist or an astronomer. My field is very narrow right here. All it has in it is two elements, how people are fooled and how they fool themselves. Tonight on NOVA, James Randi magician and investigator of psychic phenomena. Don't laugh, this is science. For 25 years, Randy has explored the world of the paranormal and tested claims of supernatural powers. Jesus. Now Randy journeys to Russia to challenge psychics never before seen in the West. After decades of research, can we finally discover the secrets of the psychics? What's the problem here? I mean, this is good-natured fun. Well, because it's a very dangerous thing to believe in nonsense. The first thing you know, you're giving your money to the charlatans, you're giving your emotional security, and in some cases, you're giving your life to them. Throw them up there on the stage. You don't have to leave with those pills. He had people who were on medication, necessary medication, like nitroglycerin tablets for heart attacks, digitalis, things like oral insulin. He had them come out of the audience and throw their pills up on stage. That's a blow of defeat for the devil. That's As you see it, this the is the real danger in all the faith healing. It's one of the real dangers. The other danger is emotional dependence on charlatans like this. People who claim that they have an ability to tell you how to run your life and how to recover from disease. Somebody praise him! More Americans believe in psychic power than in evolution. And this continuing trend away from the belief in science has Randy concerned. I'm afraid our descent into a, another dark age is accelerating. It's accelerating because information is more easily available and misinformation at the same rate. I'm afraid it's easier to become silly now because uh, we have access to nonsense uh, much faster and in full color. But with all of this supposed psychic phenomena crowding the world wide web, Randy still has an unmatched challenge. Can psychics really sense what you can't? Can the stars predict your future? You have Jupiter in the uh, seventh house. And thousands of nurses say their touch can heal. I'll give them a million dollars if they can prove that. Tonight, the supernatural, exposed by an expert on the bazaar. Randy and his foundation have uh, put up one million dollars as a prize. Uh, oh, this is the one in Finland. To anyone who could prove they have paranormal abilities. A million dollars. It's in the bank. We check. If they say they can defy gravity, step over to the window there and step out. And if, it, if you don't fall, hey, you win. You win. <laughs> you win. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to tell you, first of all, what a great pleasure it is to be back at Princeton. It's been many years since I've been here. I've been many places in between all over the world. And um, I'm sort of that way. I've got to keep moving. It's like a con man. He never tries to play the same area twice and within a certain generation. But I am um, very busy. I happily announce to you. I um, should formally... Um, accept this honor that has been granted me. I'm here today as one of the speakers in the Princeton University Lecture Series. This one supported through the Spencer Trask Fund, which was established, quote, for the purpose of securing the services of eminent men to deliver public lectures before the university on subjects of special interest, close quotes. Eminent women, it seems, um, would not have been invited back in 1891 when the Trask Fund was first set up. 
Note that, please. However, since Margaret Mead was invited back in 1975 to speak under these auspices, evidently the spectrum of possible eminent persons has doubled as if by magic. This is encouraging indeed. I'm sure you'll agree. As a Spencer Trask lecturer, I find myself in the company not only of Dr. Mead, but of such luminaries as Bertrand Russell and T.S. Eliot, though I shall in all likelihood share with you some of my philosophy, I will not be enlightening you with any anthropological wisdom nor with any poetry, and you can be very grateful for that aspect of my talk today. I'm sure that Spencer Trask, let alone any Princeton alumnus, until just a few years ago, could not have imagined that one in my position here at this lectern would not only be heard by all those present, but would be seen and heard simultaneously by a wonderful development known as the internet, merely by looking in on a computer screen. Wonderful. So science and technology have achieved this for us and much more. And along the way, dazzled by what's good about these activities, we have allowed ourselves to begin accepting some ridiculous claims and doctrines that have all the appearance but lack the quality and integrity of true science. Now the question arises, of course, why am I, a confessed magician, conjurer, a mountebank, whichever term you prefer, appearing here to criticize good people of science and technology? The reason can be found in my expertise. I have a very specialized field. I know two things with a great deal of expertise. One, how people are fooled, that's what one does as a magician, you deceive people for purposes of entertainment, and you hope that you do make it a pleasant experience for them. The second one is much more important. You know how people fool themselves. That's the critical one here. So you can fool people, and you know how they fool themselves. Having knowledge of both those fields is very valuable to someone in my position. Now, as a magician, one of the first things that uh, I learned along the way was that people make assumptions. Most of the magicians, when they work on stage, they allow people to make assumptions. Instead of telling them, this box is empty, they take the box and toss it on the stage, and it sounds empty, and it probably is. But they don't say, that box is empty, because you tend not to believe that when you're told it, because you know this guy is tricky. So they allow people to make assumptions, and they do that gladly, very willingly. Oh, they fall into that immediately. No problem. And you are saying to yourselves as you sit there smugly, I don't make any assumptions, not me. I need to have evidence, right? Well, you see, I can prove to you, I think, as a magician, that you have already made a couple of assumptions. Now, we all make assumptions where we become catatonic. I can tell you from my experience of traveling around the world as I do, that certain things are pretty consistent. For example, in every country I've ever been in, when I look at traffic signals, we have red and amber and green. Red means go. Red, I'll be all right, keep your seats, I'll be okay. Another attack of salinity or whatever it is. Green means go. Red means stop, and amber means go like hell. We all know that, of course. We recognize that. And I can tell you in every country I've ever been in, that has been consistent. So when you step up to a, a curb and you see traffic slowing down and stopping, and there are other people with you, you look at a traffic light across the street facing you, and you see it turn from red to green, you can assume that you can step off the curb and cross the street without getting run down, except in New York City. There are exceptions to every rule, of course. So you've made an assumption there, but that assumption is based upon previous knowledge and good common sense. But you see, in stepping off the curb even, you make an assumption. The assumption you make is that that street is solid under your feet. Now, I saw you folks coming in here tonight. I didn't see one of you test the chair that you sat down in. I didn't see anybody lower the seat and push on it to make sure that it would support them. You assumed that it would. Because if you didn't assume certain things, you would become catatonic. You'd freeze up, you'd be afraid to do anything. And you've made a couple of assumptions about me already. For example, I'm standing here and I'm looking out at you and you assume that I have a pretty eye. I, I can see there are people in the balcony, but that's about all I can see and there are people on the main floor, but I couldn't recognize one of you because I 
have very bad eyesight and I normally wear glasses. These are not glasses, these are empty frames. <laughs> My real glasses are here. I shall now don the real glasses. Oh, there you are. Hello. Good evening. My name is James Randy. We should start all over again because now I can see you. Oh, and the balcony is pretty full too. No jumping from the balcony until the final applause, please. Okay? Now that's an assumption you made, but it was based upon your expectation. I didn't come out here and say, these are glasses. Or you might have doubted it, you see. And you've also assumed that I'm using this microphone, which I'm not. That microphone is switched off, you see. And even though I've leaned in close to it, that microphone is switched off. My microphone is here underneath the tie, and the audio man goes absolutely berserk if you have it underneath the tie because it cuts out the high frequencies. There, that should be much better. I just did that to get him hot. He just had an attack of the vapors, no doubt. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I do these little uh, stunts to prove points. There are points I have to make this evening. And uh, that point that I've just made, that you do make assumptions and that you're uh, apt to make many more assumptions during your life, I want you to remember that. That's sort of lesson number one. I'm going to give you this evening many examples of expertise gone awry. Uh, now, we assume, or we should be able to assume, that the U.S. Patent Office would know the possible from the impossible, but apparently they do not. Allow me to enlighten you on that subject. The Patent Office, the U.S. Patent Office in Washington, D.C., within the last few months has patented, everyone seated? Good, I hate to see people falling down from shock. Issued a patent from the U.S. Patent Office in Washington, D.C. for the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I can give you the patent number. Oh, stay seated. There's more. Just two weeks ago, they issued a patent. Are you ready? For toast. Now, what does this mean? First of all, it means there's no intellect whatsoever to be found within the U.S. Patent Office, obviously. Second thing it means is, if you make toast, you are now infringing upon a patent. Your kitchen may be raided by the toast police any moment at all. Patent officers will descend in black helicopters on ropes with masks and machine guns to attack the sanctity of your home because you made toast without having a license for it. Well, I got news for you. I have put in an application for a patent for the circle. <laughs> Funny, yeah, but in Australia, just two months ago, a man obtained a patent for the wheel. So they're just as crazy in Australia as we are in the United States, and that's refreshing to a certain extent. Can you imagine patenting toast? Oh, well, along with that, over the past five years, the U.S. Patent Office has patented three perpetual motion machines. Three of them. Do they work? No, I haven't got a working model, but we're working on it. Oh, something better that originated right on this campus. From a laboratory on this campus, they were issued a patent by the U.S. Patent Office for what I call the ESP clapper. Now, you know the clappers, and the lights go on and, and the lights go off. They have obtained a patent for a machine and circuitry and electronics and such you walk into a dark room and you think in your mind, clap, clap, you don't clap, you just think that in your mind, and the lights go on. And then you think, clap, clap, a second time, and the lights go off. If you believe that, I've got some swamp land in Florida, you may be very interested in purchasing. There are various other everyday devices, one of which I'll show you in a moment, and an array of crackpot inventions and designs that simply do not work. Now, I've investigated a number of these personally. Omni Magazine and Time Magazine years ago sent me out to see a fellow named Ed Newman in Mississippi, which may explain the whole thing. He has a free energy machine. It's a perpetual motion machine. He hasn't obtained a patent on it yet, and he is suing the patent office. He shouldn't have any problem getting a patent on that. If they patent toast, they can certainly patent his machine. I don't see why they're refusing him a perfectly legitimate patent. You see, it's politically correct. Everybody should have a patent. 
I don't know. I went to see Ed Newman's machine. Unfortunately, when I went there to interview him, it wasn't working. He had trouble with the lubricants and such. I went also to Big Sandy, Texas. Big Sandy, Texas has a population of 404, changeable at any given moment. Bill Lucas in Big Sandy, Texas had a perpetual motion machine which consisted of a Toyota transmission connected to a thing like a Ferris wheel that was connected to a generator that ran another bit all the way around the circle. And when I was there, it, it didn't work too well either. When I was there, he uh, had some problem oh, with, lu with lubrication again, yeah, because there was friction in this thing somehow, and he couldn't get rid of the damn friction. There was a big problem with that. Huh. And uh, some ladies in Budapest, when I was there years ago, actually obtained a copyright, a copyright on their magnetic bodies. They could attract pieces of metal to their body and make them stick there. Well, um, a leading philosopher there, Janos Zaradenko, uh, uh, met with me and he said, I'm worried about this because, you know, they're, they're after your million dollars. And he said the, the uh, professors at the university there said that they saw these women working. What were they doing? They were taking large coins and sticking them on their forehead like that and going, <laughs> and they would stay there <laughs> and out of breath. Then a, a small saucer, a little saucer, a ceramic saucer like that on the forehead and, and it would stay there. And Jonas turned to me and he said, is this it? I said, it doesn't get any better. <laughs> you would think that some of them would really be clever. But the magnetic ladies of Hungary were not all that clever, but they did get a copyright on this particular talent. Now, I represent the James Randi Educational Foundation. We're in Florida, and we offer uh, services to the media and to students, inventors, researchers, we have a very large library there, both in video and in books. I always look at the book library and I say, this is about 96% total nonsense, but we got to keep up with the opposition, you see. And the other 6% is mostly my books. But we do have a large book library there, as I say, and we have um, a very large video library with many hundreds of hours of programs. And people are welcome to come in there. So if you're ever in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, do look us up and come by and visit. We'd be happy to see you. But the JREF, as we affectionately refer to it, has a more important function as well. We offer a million dollar prize to any person or persons who can provide evidence of any paranormal, occult, or supernatural event of any kind under proper observing conditions. It's that simple, friends. That simple. All they have to do is do what they say they can do and walk away with a million dollars. Now, you would think that they'd be hammering at this door right now and in fact, we do get some applications saying, am I too late? Did someone win it? And I said, no, I wouldn't worry too much. <laughs> but they're in a panic. They've got sweat on the forehead. Did I make it in time? A gentleman, now, I'm not, I'm not kidding you. When I'm a magician, I will lie to you, you see. And I'll lie shamelessly because I'm entertaining you. But believe me, this is quite true. Linda, my secretary, came to me shaking her head. I said, what now? She said, I took him into the library. I said, who? He said, a fellow from Mexico, it's, it's sort of sad, he came all the way from Mexico to win the million dollars. And he's got a suitcase with him. An empty suitcase for the million dollars. <laughs> I could pack it down smaller than that suitcase, I'm sure, if we ever had to give it away. I went in to meet the gentleman and through an interpreter friend of mine, we uh, found that he glows in the dark. He was visited by some UFOs OVNIs, as they're known in Spanish, O-V-N-I's. And um, he said that he glows in the dark, and you can clearly see it. Really, well, our library has no windows in it, and we can seal it off, and it is quite light tight. We've done various experiments in there. We did this experiment. He walked into the room with us, and the first question was, where are you? I can't see you. Oh, I'm right over here glowing. Uh, I don't see you. Oh, well, you're probably not sensitive enough. Get somebody else in here. Well, we got the whole staff in there. Uh, needless to say, we could not see the gentleman, though he said that he was glowing very strongly because he was radioactive after being visited by the UFOs. But that's the kind of thing we get. Where is John Edward, for example, who speaks with the dead? 
the guy on the sci-fi channel and now syndicated in something like 380 stations around the United States on TV. This guy says he speaks with dead people. Oh, really? Well, we did a bit of investigation on uh, John Edward. And uh, I was sent a videotape by, I think it was uh, Inside Edition. Um, and they said, we'll allow you to choose a part of this videotape to make comments on. And I said, well, to be perfectly fair, I will take, say, the first minute of it uh, so that I won't select through for something that proves my point. And uh, so I just put the videotape machine on, and Andrew Harder stood at my side, and we watched the opening of the show. We only used the first 45 seconds. That was quite sufficient for our needs. In 45 seconds, confronted with a gentleman sitting in the audience with his wife, the gentleman who said that he wanted to contact the spirit of his deceased father, he knew that much, and the audience knew that much. He took 45 seconds to make 23 guesses. That's more than one guess every two seconds. You have to really speak quickly to do that. The transportation business, I see something about a train, there's a uniform involved in the same thing, it goes on and on and on like this very quickly. We slowed it all down and we played it back, transcribed it. Now, during that 45 seconds, from the beginning to the end, the man started to cry. The tears came down his face. He began to sob and he was doing this kind of a thing and his wife had her arm around him and he turned to her and he says, that's him, that's him. 23 guesses. 20 of them were wrong. The three that were right, now that's 87%, friends. If your kid came home from school with 13 out of 100 on a test paper, you'd be alarmed, wouldn't you? But apparently not with John Edward, because that's enough. They don't need it to be any more than that. But what were the three that were right out of the 23? A, this man is dead. <laughs> He's an older man. And there's a younger man connected with him. Yeah, the guy sitting right there in the chair. Those were the only three things that were right. He had nothing significant to tell this man, and yet this man was reduced to tears and sobbing. That's how easy it is to be what we call in the trade a cold reader. That's the technique. It's a game of 20 questions, really. Now, we've challenged endless number of times John Edward to come for the million dollar prize. I've appeared in the last couple of months a few times on the uh, Larry King show. We challenged uh, Sylvia Brown as well. She does the same act. It's a case of, I'm getting a J here, a J or a G. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. If the dead are talking to this guy or to Sylvia, why do they come over and say, Sylvia, ask him if my name starts with J or G. No. <laughs> why wouldn't they say something like, Gary, you know, that's my name, and I'm his dad. No, and they'll say something like, uh, G, I have a G, a Gary. Yes, was this your brother? No, it's my dad. Yes, I knew he was in the family, yeah. yeah. That's the act that they are doing. Now, every now and then, it changes from cold reading to what we call hot reading. People who attend the John Edward show are kept for up to two hours in a relatively small room where young couples walk around and make conversation with them. Hi, my name's Sally, and, and this is George here, and uh, we, we've been here for several readings. You're going to have a reading today? And they get into conversation. Is it any wonder that every now and then John Edward can say, and I'm getting something about Sweden, sir, are you connected with Sweden? this kind of thing? And indeed, it turns out to be correct. So that's what we call a hot reading, when they can get information in advance. Now, we have challenged Sylvia Brown. She agreed for the million dollars on the Larry King show that she would, she would be tested. Well, then, what, uh, 171 days or something went by before we heard from her, and we only heard from her when she was invited back on the program with me. And I said, what about it, Sylvia? It's been 171 days now. Uh, made up your mind? Oh, yes, I'll be no problem. I don't have any problem being tested. And we agreed to the terms right there on the program, and she agreed to do it. It's now been, what, 41 days or something like that. So we're just waiting. We've given her the time span during which she can do this. And she can't be reached because she says right on her webpage, uh, Sylvia does not read or respond to email. 
There's no number for her. You can only reach this 800 number where you make an appointment to have a reading. There's no other way to reach her. We have sent registered letters to her headquarters in California. And she gets the registered letters. She signs for them. But she doesn't respond to them. So we'll just wait out another 171 days and probably get back on Larry King again. And she'll say, well, I've had a headache or something like that. I really don't know what her answer could possibly be. This is the kind of thing that really makes us very angry. The amateurs come to us. The amateurs come to us, but the professionals never do. The big people in the business, because they say, oh, I don't need his million dollars. Hey, show me somebody who doesn't want to get a million dollars in negotiable bonds for doing 30 minutes of work. In some cases, 15 minutes will do it. That's all they have to do. Do what they do every day and get paid for, and I'll pay you a million dollars. I can't be any more generous than that. And no one has ever passed the preliminary test. So, yes, we do preliminary tests. We uh, make the preliminary tests much easier. We usually use odds of a thousand to one uh, that against chance of this happening. Now, we negotiated for some time with a couple of ladies from Lithuania, by letter and fax, back and forth. And uh, we said we would appoint a medical person in Lithuania to test them because she said she could do diagnose and healing, diagnosis and healing just by passing her hands around the body. I said, never mind the healing thing. That's uh, an if or but thing. We don't know. But diagnosis, we can accept that. That's a simple thing. And if you succeed in the diagnosis, we'll go on to the healing thing if you want. But stay in Lithuania. Well, they didn't. They showed up at our front door early on a Monday morning with an interpreter. Okay, come on in. Do a diagnosis of moi. Now, just three days before, I'd had a whole stress test, heart test, the whole thing, complete physical. Every, I, I don't want to mention some of the parts they examined. Very thorough. Guess what, folks? Every disease that a 73-year-old man like me should have was diagnosed, and I don't have any of them, unfortunately for them. But she did say I had a fatal condition of my left kidney. So I'm watching that. <laughs> fatal condition of my left kidney. And I said, okay, um, but what if a year from now I still haven't got any problem with the left kidney? Oh, it could take much longer than that. It could take up to 30 years. <laughs> so I ask you, how can these people be wrong? The answer is they can't be wrong. There's no way they can be wrong if they have excuses to offer like that all the time. Now, I'm a rather patient guy. I'm easy. I really am. You don't have to do acrobatics or a good card trick or anything like that to convince me you've got powers. I can be convinced for much less than that. I'm going to um, talk about something which that illustrates very well. I would like to see hands, please. And holding your hand up isn't like this. It's like this, so I can really see it. If anyone can give me, just it doesn't have to be detailed or scientific or anything like that, just give me a, an idea of what they think homeopathy is all about. Does somebody have a, a notion? Uh, yes, sir, this gentleman right down here. Yes, homeopathy is the promise that diluting something past the point of having any atoms can still have essence that would heal people. That's essentially it, yes. Uh, the gentleman said, in case you didn't hear him, that diluting a substance down uh, beyond the point where it's... Uh, actually present in the solution anymore can still have some efficacy and they base it on theories of vibrations you see the vibrations of the original medicine are there I'm going to give you the four rules of homeopathy which should blow you away I'm glad again that you're seated I hate to see people fall over in hilarious laughter and damage themselves homeopathy started uh, over 200 years ago it was started by a man named Hahnemann Samuel Hahnemann came up with a wonderful idea. Now, 200 years ago, medicine was not then what it is today. Today, it's an art and a science. Back then, it was essentially an art. There was very little science to it. They were barely out of the age of Paracelsus, and Paracelsus, though a disagreeable chap, I never knew him, I'm not that old yet, and Paracelsus came up with this really rather smart idea. The idea was that you don't have to use natural substances, such things as, as weeds and bark and things like that, in order to heal diseases. You can use uh, simpler non-organic chemicals. And he started out by using things like uh, mercuric chloride, uh, lead acetate, uh, arsenic sulfide, 
a few things like that. And uh, the diseases, my golly, the symptoms went away like, uh, unfortunately, so did the patient. <laughs> but they were the best looking corpses in the cemetery, I can tell you that. It usually cleared up the symptoms right away. Mercuric chloride was used for a long time, even into Victorian days. And it's a deadly poison, but it was used in very small quantities, so they didn't die right away and they could pay the bill. See? Now, this is what Paracelsus introduced to medicine. So you can imagine at that time that people who could afford doctors had a much greater chance of dying from the disease or the treatment than people who couldn't afford doctors. And indeed, that seems to be supported by the statistics of the day. So Hahnemann came along with an idea that he would prepare medicines that wouldn't poison people like that. It was a good intention, but I want you to know the four rules of homeopathy, each increasingly more embarrassing. The first one is that you do what they call a proving. A proving in homeopathy, and I'm not going to go into all the details, that would take me three nights here. The proving consists of taking a substance, we'll call it substance X, and you give it to a patient who is well, that is to a person who is well. Now, that definition isn't derived at maybe somebody who can walk and sit down and stand up again and is warm would be a person that's well, I don't know. But you give it to a person as well, and that person develops symptoms A, B, and C. Now, we'll say that the substance is uh, the, the milk from milkweed. Oh, that must taste awfully bad, the sap from milkweed. Uh, you give that to a, a well patient in approving, and in this proving, the patient develops these three symptoms. A, uh, face gets very, very red, head swells up round like a balloon, and every 20 minutes he falls down on the ground a dead faint. Now those are symptoms you'd be likely to notice. I think you'll agree with that. So they write that down in the book. That's called the proving. That's the first rule of homeopathy. Second rule of homeopathy is, suppose you have a patient walk into the office, and the patient sits down and says, oh, am I sick? And the homeopath looks at the patient and notices that the patient has head swollen up like a balloon that's bright red. And the homeopath says, hmm, every 20 minutes you fall down on the ground in a dead faint. And the patient looks and says, doctor, you're wonderful. Yes, I do. Wait a minute. You go through the book. And you find out what caused that in a well patient. And then you give them that medicine and that reverses the effect. Don't look at me. It's their idea. And the people down there are going, wow. And yeah. It's their idea, not mine. I'm just telling you what it's all about. Third rule of homeopathy says you don't do that. I told you they got sillier as they went along. Third rule of homeopathy says that you give them a highly diluted mixture of that substance. You haven't heard dilution until you hear this. I'm going to step over to the board here. This is the simple mathematical lesson, okay? 10 to the power of 1 is 10. Okay, we knew that. 10 to the power of 2 is 100. It's the number of zeros after the 1 that the index refers to. Okay, so 10 cubed, 10 to the third power has three zeros, and it goes on and on like that, okay? Now, in homeopathy, to prepare a solution, you take one part of the substance and you put it in 10 parts of water, and then you success it. That would be called a one solution. They never use that, far, far too strong. Now what they do to prepare it is they take the substance, put it in the water, and then they success it. That means shake it up and down 10 times, sideways 10 times, and back and forth 10 times, in three different dimensions, 10 times each. That's called succession, I call it shaking it. <laughs> but I'm not scientific, so what do I know? That's a one solution. As I say, they never use that. Then they take one part of that solution and put it in 10 parts of water and chugga, chugga, chugga the whole thing all over again. And they get a two solution, one part in 100. You follow now? Then they repeat it one more time, 10 parts, and they get one in a 1,000. But that's far, far, far too concentrated. No. They prefer dilutions of one in 10 to the 20th parts of water. That's one with 20 zeros after it. That's what I call dilute. <laughs> attenuated is the term they use. Attenuated, that's really attenuated. And the fourth rule of homeopathy, as if you weren't ready for it, the more dilute the medicine is, the stronger it is. <laughs> I told you they get silly as you go along. 
Now, I happen to have some homeopathic medicines here on the table. No, I have homeopathic preparations. I won't dignify them by calling them uh, medicines. This one is called uh, cold and flu relief. This is a spray. Oh, it's got a rebate offer. Damn, I missed that. Mm. Breakthrough medicine, no side effects, that's true. My question is, are there any other effects? It does remove that dreadful lump in your wallet because it's very expensive. Active ingredients, folks, listen to this now. Active ingredients, oh. See, the, the one that's listed first is the one that's the most prevalent in the compound. Arsenicum album, in brackets it says arsenious acid. Not to be confused with Arsenio Hall, of course. Arsenious acid, hmm. What concentration? 30x. That means one followed by 30 zeros, parts of water, and one part of arsenicum album. I wouldn't worry about it. I wouldn't worry about it at all, friends, because that's what the 30x means. Now, wait a minute. We passed a certain point here. It's called uh, sort of the point of no return, I suppose, but the fellow named Avogadro came up with a thing called Avogadro's Limit, Avogadro's Number, and all. he was very awkward, but he was right. What's that? Sorry? I was just about to tell them that, yes. Mm -hmm. You're patting your part. You're the one who runs on in flames afterwards, isn't it? Uh, yes, turn to the 23rd. Once it, got to, it gets to a, a 23rd uh, solution there, if you can call it a solution at that point, there is only a chance of there being one molecule or atom of the original substance present in the mixture. So by the time you get to 10 to the 24th, you've got one chance in 10 of there being one molecule there. I'm going to illustrate something for you. You see, I have here also a box of another homeopathic compound. This is Calm's Forte, a sleep aid, non-habit forming, I'll bet. 100% natural, no side effects, you see. Again, they tell us this. I uh, see. Now, there are 32 capsules in here. Not too long ago, I did a, a demonstration for the U.S. Congress, a, a group of congressmen and congressional aides, and I started the lecture by going to an aide that was sitting down the front row, and I gave him a $20 bill, and I said, I want you to run across the street to the Eckert's Pharmacy over there, a big pharmaceutical chain, and I said, I want you to buy me two boxes of this, and I gave him an original box, and he came back with the two boxes. I had to open them up, and pour all the pills, 32 pills and 32 pills, that makes 64, and uh, put them in the glass there, and he put them in the glass, and I told the congressional aides and congressmen there what this was all about, and I downed 64 of them. Took a glass of water, swallowed them down. They're in a, a base of lactic acid, which is lactose, and tastes about like packing material, I would say, uh, sort of like the plaster or something, it's a really bad taste. and. Um, it says on the package, it says, uh, maximum dose, two tablets every eight hours. In case of an overdose, call your poison control center. <laughs> I'm still here, Charlie. I th took 32 tablets, and though some of the congressmen fell asleep, I didn't. I'm still here, and I do this regularly except that lactic acid really tastes awful. It's nasty stuff. But there's nothing in these tablets. Oh, what is the active ingredient? Come on, you should be able to tell me by now. Caffeine, you got it. The sleeping pill. It works the opposite way. Don't look at me, it's their idea, not mine. This is what homeopathy is all about. But wait, it gets better. I said that the more diluted it is, the better it works, right? Ha <laughs> ha! Guess how high they go, folks? They go up to 10 to the power of 1,500. <laughs> I'm not going to start writing the zeros, I'll tell you that. Those zeros would run right out, out of the room, I'm sure. That's really powerful stuff when you get to that extent. Now, I asked my good friend Martin Gardner, formerly of Scientific American Magazine, I said, Martin, do a little math for me, would you? Uh, save me some time and I'll have it from an authority like you. 
I said, what is that equivalent to? And he said, well, you need sort of a metaphor. I said, yes, some sort of figure of speech because I'm talking to, to technically minded people, scientifically minded people, and the layman and reasonably intelligent folks who can grasp something if it's a little, made a little easier for them. And figures like uh, 1,500 uh, 1, dilution, such, I don't care how scientific you are, you just can't get a notion of it unless it's simplified for you, and here it is. He said that's equivalent to taking one grain of rice, that's one, one, uno, eins, one grain of rice, crushing it to a powder and dissolving it in a sphere of water the size of the solar system <laughs> with the sun at the center and the orbit of Pluto at the outside. Wait a minute. What about chuka chuka chuka? <laughs> I don't know. It's their problem, not mine. And then repeating that process two billion times. <laughs> now, if that ain't dilute, I don't know what is. But folks, sure, you can laugh at this. We all laugh at this. It's comical. It's juvenile. It's asinine. There's no other way to describe it. But these medicines are being sold in leading pharmacies today, pharmaceutical chains across the country. And just recently, just three or four days ago, they came up on the internet offering people who are worried about terrorist attacks homeopathic medicine that they say are antidotes for radiation poisoning, bubonic plague, smallpox, and anthrax. Now, if this isn't taking advantage of people's grief and their need for some sort of relief, I don't know how else you can determine it. I mean, you can't label it any other way. These are swindlers, liars, cheats, frauds, fakes, criminals. Come on, sue me. No, they won't sue me. They know damn well their case won't stand up in a court of law. It doesn't stand up in science at all. It falls apart. And they say, but we've got these affidavits. Yeah, Nixon said he didn't know about Watergate, too, and he was the president of the United States, remember? Now, am I understandably angry about this thing? Have I got a good cause to be angry and to run this foundation in Florida? and try to attract people to it so they subscribe to the foundation and help to support us, which I'm shamelessly doing for you right now. If you want to do it on a more local level, I would suggest that uh, there is a local group here, and uh, they published this letter. It's called Factum, the newsletter of the Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking, not too far away. This is, uh, has really good material. It's small, but it always has very good material in it. And you can reach these people on their web page, which is www.fact, that's P-H-A-C-T, clever, right? Philadelphia, P-H, fact, got it? Whoa, fact.org. I suggest you click in on that one of these days, take a look at it. It's a very reputable organization. They have good meetings and uh, various gatherings of various kinds that you can really benefit from and talk to people who know what they're talking about in this field. Now, if you want to get onto my webpage, it's www.randy, that's R-A-N-D-I, please, .org. And um, we change it every weekend, every Friday at noon or so. It changes as if by magic. Of course, I have to write the article or it doesn't change. And uh, we archive all of that. And we do a live Internet program on Thursday nights at 9 o'clock, Florida time. That is Eastern Florida, because there are two time zones in Florida alone. Can you believe it? A little bit on one end, they decided to join Texas and the rest of them. I don't know why. Now, wait a minute. This doesn't relate to you directly if you don't take homeopathic medicines or don't have someone in your family or your friends that takes homeopathic medicines. I want to show you something that does relate to you with a, a rather nice little demonstration, I think. How many of you, by a show of hands here, have ever walked into a restaurant or a store and offered something like a $50 bill and had them go into the register and take from it a black pen looking about like this and make a stroke on the bill and then throw the bill into the drawer and accept it. How many of you have, have seen this? Oh, yes, a great number. It must be very popular here. Well, this is patented again by the U.S. Patent Office. Thank you very much. It's patent number, where the hell is it? Uh, 5063163, U.S. Patent. This is it. It's called the counterfeit detector pen. It's called the smart money counterfeit detector pen. Pardon me. Don't get stuck with a bogus buck. It says right here. <laughs> Made by Drymark USA. 
sold by the millions every month here in the United States of America and used by a great number of restaurants and department stores and such. I'm going to do a test. I'm an experimental type soul. I, I always go for experiments. I, I went deep into my wallet and came out with a, with a $50 bill. This is a relatively good one. I'm going to ask this the gentleman right here, would you take the pen, please, and uncap the pen for me? Oh, very well done. I can see you're going to work very well with this. Now, would you just make a stroke on the clear part of the bill there, please? What color would you call it? Uh, brown. Uh, brown, sort of amber, right? This is a perfectly good $50 bill then, isn't it? <laughs> it's yours. Give me back the pen. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be, want to be without this, you see, in case I come punch it. What is it? I read the patent paper for it, folks. It's iodine, tincture of iodine in this pen. We all remember in chemistry class when the, the teacher did a demonstration where he took a, a, a potato and cut it in half and put tincture of iodine on it, it turned black. Because starch turns black under the effect of free iodine, you see? Isn't that wonderful? Well, the theory on which this thing was patented was that counterfeiters use cheap paper. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Think of the markup in the product from worthless to $100. That's a big markup, friends. Do you really think the counterfeit is going to go into Office Depot and say, like I dream of your cheapest paper, please, I'm going to print $100 bills? <laughs> I don't think so. Now, the reason that that one tested genuine is because it was printed on newsprint. The same kind of paper that's right on that pad there. Ordinary newsprint doesn't have any sizing or starch in it, but regular paper does. Not the money that U.S. currency is printed on. That's rag bond. It's very expensive paper, very sturdy paper. It doesn't have any of that starch in it. Well, now, I'm going to reveal a secret to you. This is a confession, okay? Every now and then, I drive my secretary, Linda, a little crazy, and I say, uh, give me my checkbook. She says, you're not going to do it again. Yes. I go to the bank, and I take out a couple of thousand dollars in $50 bills. Can you see it coming? I take them into the library, spread them out on the table, spray them with Niagara spray starch. <laughs> yeah. He's a fiend, isn't he? I turn them all over and I spray them on the back. Let them dry, shuffle them all up, and I say, Linda, yeah, I know, you're going back to the bank. Yep. I go back to the bank and I redeposit. So I don't lose any interest on it whatsoever. And the bank teller says, you brought it back, you just took it out. Yeah, but I changed my mind. No. You change your mind every month, don't you, Mr. Annie? Yes, I do. That goes back into circulation. And people are being booted out of restaurants and department stores every place for having presented counterfeit money. Will you do the same thing, please? Do this. And maybe people will begin to get the idea, maybe this counterfeit pen doesn't really work. Well, I called the Secret Service. Secret Service has two major functions, protecting the President of the United States and counterfeit money. Now, wait a minute, just for a second. I'm going to read you the law on this. If you are presented with a counterfeit bill, you look at it and you can see that it's badly printed or something else gives it away to you, you give it to somebody in the store, they look at it and say, that's a phony. If they give it back to you, that's a federal offense. They are placing back in circulation a federal document that they know to be false. That is against the law, and you can go to prison for it. It's a serious offense. So you say to them, no, I'm sorry, uh, you've got it, you've got to keep it. You can't give it back to me, and I'm going to use that to... Uh, no. So you run into a bit of an impasse here, don't you? Mm-hmm. Well, your job is to call the Secret Service or a local police officer and have this thing settled. And the police officer is supposed to take down the details of the person, et cetera. And the law goes on like this. But people do return these things in a restaurant. Oh, no, can't take that bill, sir. Oh, this is a good one. Let me see. Oh, yeah, perfectly good. Throw it in the drawer. And away they go. Well, now, I'm, I'm an easy soul, as I said. I told you just a minute ago, standing behind that lectern right there. I'm an easy soul. I'm easy to convince of anything. I called the... Secret Service. I asked him a simple question. This on the phone now, you see. And this is a government official who doesn't have any of his own opinions. He gets it out of a book. And if it's not in the book, he doesn't have an opinion. So I said to him, uh, this is James Randy, and so on and so on. So now, how do you do, Mr. Randy? What can I do for you? Uh, I have one of these counterfeit detector pens here. He said, oh, yes. I said, um, does it work? 
Well, I don't think so, Mr. Andy, but uh, just a minute, I'll look it up here. I've seen it, 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 uh, it is not dependable. <laughs> I said, not dependable? How about, like, totally not dependable, like 100%? He said, well, you could say that. I said, why didn't you say that? He said, well, that's not what's in the book. He says, it's not dependable here in the book. So I sent a letter to the Secret Service in Washington. It took me four and a half months to get an answer, but I got an answer. And I asked him a simple question. Has any issue of counterfeit money ever been detected using the counterfeit pen? Four and a half months took them to answer me. And they wrote back and they said no. But are they going to do anything about stopping the sale of this thing? Why would I want to stop the sale of this thing? For a very good reason, folks, it's costing you and me money. Because this allows real counterfeit money to stay in circulation. Because the damn pen doesn't work. So you don't learn how to look at money and find out whether it's the real thing. And there are certain tests you can do with it. Very simply, just observation should do it for you. There are secret markings and things you can look for that counterfeiters cannot duplicate easily. They're there on the bill. You should be able to tell yourself. But if you use the counterfeit pen, he said, perfectly all right, on a counterfeit bill, and they're not going to use paper that has starch on it, I can assure you, you're putting that money back into circulation. And you're costing us the hundreds of thousands of dollars that are issued in counterfeit money in this country. It costs us a lot of money. It amounts to millions and there's millions of dollars in circulation right now in this country, which is counterfeit. And they're allowing, by not closing this operation down, they're allowing more of it to stay in circulation. Now, you can get a very good booklet from the Secret Service. Know Your Money, it's called. K-N-O-W, not N-O. Know Your Money. It's very good. It shows you exactly where to look and find out whether or not the money is counterfeit. But they won't stop this operation. Oh, am I angry at government agencies? Yeah, for a very good reason. I have dealt with a lot of them, and in a minute I'm going to tell you about a dealing that I had going with the FBI. And that was not a pleasant experience, believe me. But before I do that, I see people sitting here looking um, as if to say, he's telling us about really dense people, uneducated, unsophisticated people that would fall for this sort of thing. Not moi. No three. I'm going to do a bit of a, a brain buster for you. I want to see an honest show of hands now. Are there any amateur magicians or professional magicians in the audience tonight? There, uh, you would confess to that, do you? I see. If I already knew these two gentlemen over here, are there any others? How about up in the balcony there? We got any? I don't see any hands. Okay. Oh, there's another one right down there. How do you do, sir? What kind of magic do you do? Close-up magic, I see. That's supposed to be, that's sort of the, the, the queen, uh, the, the king, or if you want, of magic. What kind of magic do you guys do? Close-up? Yeah, really? I see. Well, that's uh, very honored in the profession. I have um, a trick here, which is, uh, and I admit to you, it's a trick. I'm not John Edwards. See, this is a trick. These are ESP cards. It's a circle, plus mark, wavy lines, square, and a five-pointed star. You see, there's one line, two lines. See how clever it is? Three lines, four lines, and five points. They couldn't quite get one with five lines. And uh, they're, they're done on bicycle cards to make them more obvious for a demonstration. Normally, they're the size of little bridge cards, but you can't see those at a distance. So I do it with these very large cards. Now, these were designed by a fellow named Zener many years ago. And the Zener cards, oh, over here. The Zener cards, as they're known, are made in such a way that they appear to be quite different one from the other. They can't be mistaken one for the other very easily, you see. I also have here a piece of black photographic paper, and they, oh, this is one with the automatic sticker. You don't have to lick it. Don't take that off and then lick it. It really spoils the whole effect. Um, press it, seal it, it's called. Okay, good, I can take that, thank you. They implied this for my use. And uh, I would like to give these to somebody in the audience that I, I don't know, I know, I know you, and uh, I need some. How about the gentleman around the end here? Would you be kind enough to take these from me, please? Five cards, piece of black paper, and an envelope. Do I know you, sir? No. Do you know me? Sure. <laughs> People usually say no, and I say, how do you know it's not me then? Well, yeah, but you ruined my good line. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you to do this, or I'm going to turn my back on you in case I should get a glimpse or something like that. And just follow the instructions if you would be so kind. Okay? 
take the five cards and hold them face down in your hand and shuffle them up. You can't do a whiffle shuffle with them, there are only five of them. So uh, shuffle them up very thoroughly in such a way that you don't know which one of the cards is which, okay? Okay, now take three of the cards, keeping them all face down, and place them on the floor face down between your feet on the floor. We're not going to use those. Don't look at the other two. Now you've got two ha cards left in your hand, am I correct? Okay, it's tricky, look up at me here. You've got to look away and quickly take the two cards and turn them face to face. Done? Okay? Now you didn't look at the cards, right? Now, take the two cards and put them inside the folded piece of black paper, open it up, put them inside. And, uh, I'll turn it I almost looked toward and take that package and put it inside the envelope and seal the envelope the easy way. Okay, done now? Okay, now I'm going to ask you to, uh, oh no, the other three cards are on the floor. I want you to put them between your feet so I could not see them in case they're marked on the back or something like that. Put them out of sight so that when I turn around I won't be able to see them. Okay, now hand me the card. You can pass them to the gentleman up here if you want. He'll hand them to me. Okay, now. There is a point to doing this. It's a, it's a relatively simple point. I've got to illustrate a fact for you here. Scientists, when they do tests of these things, always want to work with the statistics and with pieces of equipment, with laser beams and the infrared rays and all kinds of good stuff like that. I think if they went to investigate David Copperfield, they would probably take his fingerprints and weigh them. And then he'd saw a girl in two pieces and say, but we took his fingerprints and weighed them. We scanned them with them for red rays. Scientists go about things sometimes very strangely because they don't know how magic tricks are done. They're not supposed to know, but they go in the wrong direction quite frequently. So I'm going to do a little demonstration for you, and then I'm going to ask you some critical questions, and we'll see how well you answer. Okay? Now, what are the chances? The the, I'm asking for mathematics here now. What are the mathematical chances of my guessing what one of these cards is? Two and five. Guessing what one of the cards is that's in this envelope. One fifth, 20%, correct? Yeah, you've got five different cards. What are my chances of guessing what one of them is inside the envelope? and the chance it would be 20% or one in five. That's correct. This gentleman is disagreeing with me. What do you think? No, no, I'm talking about one card, not two cards. What are my chances of guessing one of the cards inside this envelope? One in five, believe me. It's, it's one in five, I swear. It really is, okay. Now, if I were to tell you, for example, that uh, oh, say the wavy lines and the square were in there. If I say the wavy lines, my chances are one in five. If I say the wavy lines and the square, now we have a, a slightly different situation. What are the chances of my being able to tell you what two of the symbols are? This is Princeton, right? Okay. I'm just checking. I, you know, it might have been Yale or something, which I might expect to see. It's one over five times one over four, which is one in twenty, and that's wrong too. One in ten, exactly. Congratulations, sir. I'm glad you came this evening. One in ten. If I don't tell you where they are, now the front of the envelope, front with the flap, for example, is different from the one without the flap on it, right? The the good side, the intact side, the one where the gentleman didn't seal it. If I were to tell you, for example, that the, oh, the wavy lines were on the uh, flap side of the, of the, or the, uh, the face side, pardon me, of the envelope, and the square was on the other side, then the chances would be, if I tell you on which side they are, five different cards, yeah, they'd be one in 20 then, correct? So if I say to you, for example, on this side, we have the wavy lines, on this side we have the square, and I identify it like that, and I'm right. We forgot to say that I would be right. If I were right in that case, then the chance it would be one in 20, am I correct? 
Well, let's just take a look now to make sure I will mark it right on the envelopes. Where did I put my, there it is. I'm going to mark it right on the envelope so that there's no doubt of it whatsoever that I did say that the square would be on this side and that the wavy lines would be on this side. Okay. Now that I've committed myself, if I'm wrong on this, I have to kill myself in front of you, but I'm going to do it by starvation. <laughs> so you may not want to wait around to see. Now I said the square on this side and the wavy lines on the other side. Let's just see how close I came. Gee, exactly right. The square and the wavy lines on the right sides. I usually get much better reaction than that. Now, ah, now that's the question, isn't it? Let me get to it, okay? You see, I did turn away with this envelope at one point, and I did this sort of thing and walked over to the table. I could have switched it for another envelope inside here of which I do know the contents, right? How would we prove that's not so? Look at the other three cards. See, if you'd let me get to it, you see. <laughs> let me see the other three cards and hold them up with the faces towards us so they can see that we have the, go ahead, the circle and the other two cards, right? <laughs> right? You got it? Okay. <laughs> let me have the cards now, if you would, please. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Now, I'm going to ask you the question all over again. What are the chances of my guessing what's inside that envelope, identifying both cards and in what position they are located. 100% exactly, sir. One in one. zip de doo da Because it's a trick. <laughs> what are the chances of David Carverville cutting a girl in two with a buzzsaw and having her live through the experience? One in one, 100%, unless he's got a lot of band-aids backstage there. A trick is not something that subjects itself to statistics. You don't have to scan me with infrared rays and all that sort of thing. The chances are 100%. Now, I use that as an illustration of how wrong scientists can go when they're investigating these things. Now, I'm going to give you a further example of that, and this one should really shock you, I would think. Oh, wait a minute. I need some homeopathic. <laughs> oh, my strength is at the strength of 10 if not more. <laughs> ten. Oh, by the way, that, uh, that ten, ten, ten thing, I, I didn't tell you the rest of that story. I'm sorry, I, I, I dropped that story at a certain point because I got another diagram to show you here. I uh, had the honor last year of awarding the Ig Nobel Prize in science uh, at Harvard. It's another university you may have heard of. And um, they give out the Ig Nobel Prize for real stupid things in science. And that year they had a crop. And one thing that was important, the reason I was asked there was, this prize went to Jacques Benveniste, Dr. Jacques Benveniste, in Clamart, outside Paris, France. And he was given the prize for the second time, the only person in history to win it twice. <laughs> he won it the first time for the research in which I was involved in Clamart, where we showed that he uh, didn't know what he was doing, that it was strictly spurious. And he won it the second time for this wonderful discovery, which he published on the internet, and you can read it there. Remember I said chugga 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 chug like this with the shaking the water? He's found out you don't have to do that anymore. All seated? Good. You can do it on the telephone. <laughs> Allow me to illustrate. You take a glass of homeopathic water or a bottle, it makes no difference, and you wrap 10 turns of wire around it, 10, remember? 10. And you connect that to the transmitter of your telephone after you've called up the number on the other end, which can be any place in the world. Let's take Iceland, okay. Hello, Iceland, I'm gonna send you some homeopathic word. And at the other end, on the receiver, they connect that up to 10 turns of wire, 10, very important. That's ordinary tap water. And then you keep it connected for how long? Very good. You see how quickly they learn? Isn't it wonderful? I mean, 10 seconds. They knew that just like that. For 10 seconds, exactly. And the water on the other end of the line is homeopathic. Now, I agree with one thing. They both have equal medicinal value. <laughs> that I agree with, yes. But this was the latest invention. But wait, it gets better. It gets better, folks. How could it get better? Oh, yes, it does. You can do it on the Internet. 
There is a number you can dial. You give your credit card number. You take your bottle connected to the audio output of your computer, 10 turns of wire. They send a 10-second signal over the Internet, and le voila, you now have homeopathic water. This is what he got the second Ig Nobel Prize for. Now, we offer the $1 million prize of the James Randi Educational Foundation. I should add this. We don't require long clinical tests. No, nothing like that. If the homeopaths can show us a way that they can differentiate between ordinary water and homeopathic water, that's all. Which one is which? Sort them out, and you win the million dollars. Hello? Any knocking on the door there? Hello? Quizá. I don't hear a thing from France or from Germany, from anywhere in the world. They will not take us up on this challenge. And again, they're scientists and they don't try for prizes. What about the Nobel Prize? I believe that's sort of sought after in science. Is it not? Why won't they come for our prize? One million dollars, they can do anything you want with it. Give it to starving kids. Give it to AIDS victims. Do anything you want with it. But they won't come for it. And I think there's probably a very good reason for that. And I think you and I both know what that reason is. Now, this is something that has got to shock you. Lawrence Livermore Labs in California, very well known. It's festooned with PhDs. They're all over the place. You can throw a stone in any direction, and you're sure to hit a PhD. <laughs> They're all over the place. Now, I have my own theory about PhDs. I might as well share that with you very quickly. I'm a good observer, you see. I'm not a scientist, but I am a good observer. And I have observed PhDs for many, many, many years now in all different parts of the world. And this is what I have noted. When people are made into PhDs, it's, a, it's sort of a, a sacred process. It, uh, you, can, you can hear in the back little hallelujah, hallelujah, it, it, in the distance. And there's the sound of trumpets and harps and the whole thing. If you listen very carefully, you can hear that. Because they sit down at one side of the audience here, and they're just ordinary people. A gentleman stands at a table up here, and he has all these diplomas with little ribbons around them. And he stands there in a funny square hat and purple and black robes and everything looks very dignified. And uh, he calls a name, somebody walks up the stairs, comes across, shakes him by the hand, he hands on this piece of paper and Hallelujah. there's a magical moment. That person is now no longer an ordinary person. This is a PhD. This person has taken on a certain sanctity, a certain holiness of some kind. Because the minute that piece of paper hits their hand, they walk across stage and they walk down on that side to the applause of the relatives and such, and they're a transformed individual. This happens to all of them. These people all become magically transformed. I think I know what's being done here. It's very scurrilous and sneaky. It would never occur to you if you didn't have the observing powers of moi. I noticed that the guy who hands out these diplomas wears gloves. Why? What is he afraid of? My theory is that there is a genetically engineered chemical on that little roll of paper. Very carefully, genetically altered in such a way that it does one specific thing. As the paper hits the hand, it goes into the flesh, into the bloodstream, directly to the brain, and paralyzes a part of the brain in the speech center. The part that enables the person, up until that moment, to pronounce two sentences, I was wrong and I don't know. <laughs> now, I base this upon research. I do. This is based upon sound research. I have never heard a PhD utter either one of those sentences. Not only that, I've seen them try. Oh, it's not a pretty sight. <laughs> I was really. I was really. <laughs> I don't I I've seen them try to write it. They poke the, the pen right through the paper. They, they can't do it. You know, it, it's really terrible. Ordinarily, that nothing disturbs them, but they can't pronounce either one of those two. And of course, I'm putting you on, because I'll bet if they really tried, they could. But this business of PhDs hasn't got me odd at all, because, well, for many reasons, but this is one good example of it. Little box of matches here. I was called from Lawrence Livermore Labs in California by a PhD physicist there, he said to me, Mr. Randy, I, um, I should inform you that I believe your million dollar prize has to be forfeited. I said, oh, do tell. <laughs> really worried, really worried. I had sweat broke out in beads on my forehead. 
And I said, uh, why is that? Well, because we have a gentleman visiting from Israel here. He's an admirer of Uri Geller. Remember Uri Geller used to bend spoons and things like that? Wow. And um, his name is Ronnie Marcus, and he can do absolutely wonderful things, and we've put him through a series of tests here. I said, well, describe to me the test. He said, well, the one that really, really uh, has us uh, convinced that he does have psychic powers is an experiment in telekinesis. I said, do tell, do tell, what is it? He said, well, he asked us to get him a small box of matches, and we went out to the store and we purchased these. Two of us went to make sure there was no substitution. Of they're being scientific, you see. And we brought it back to the lab, and we weighed it within a few micrograms. And we uh, tested one of the matches, lit it, yes. Yep, phosphorus, sulfur, the whole thing. Yep, that's a real match, okay. Uh-huh. And uh, we examined it with uh, infrared light, and uh, we photographed it with, uh, with polarized light, and uh, it's indeed a perfectly ordinary box of matches. So then we gave it to Ronnie Marcus, and Ronnie Marcus did the following demonstration with it. He simply put it on the back of his hand, and then while we watched, and we watched very carefully, he concentrated, and very slowly, the box of matches rose in the air and stood up on the back of his hand. And then he told the box of matches, go down, the box of matches obeyed him. Now we don't know how that's done. We've worked on this for a long time now, but we have the faintest notion how it's being done. My response was, do you have a fax machine? Oh, yes. Would you give me the number of the fax machine, please? And give me a call after I send you a fax. Gave me the number. I went to my library and I took down from the shelf a big thick book, oh, pardon me, a big thick book uh, called Impromptu Magic by Martin Gardner. Good old Martin Gardner. Page 74, the standing matchbox trick. And it says, get a new box of matches, take out some of the matches to decrease the weight, leave it open, about three-eighths of an inch at one end, as you place it down the back of your hand, and as you close it, pinch some of the skin on the back of your hand into the matchbox, like that, and then, simply by tensing the skin on the back of your hand, uh, the matchbox will stand up, and then it will go back down again, you see? I faxed this page to Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. That was four years ago. <laughs> Hello? Are you there? Lawrence, Mr. Livermore, are you there? No response from then on, and Ronnie Marcus went back to Israel somewhat defeated. Now, these are simple, simple kids' tricks that you do at the party instead of having to put the lampshade on your head and run around naked to entertain people. The matchbox tricks is much better. I can assure you. Well, with some people it might not be. But that is how simple these things are, and it fooled a whole room full of PhDs. Incredible, but you see the assumption is I'm well-educated and I'm intelligent. I've got a high IQ, so anything I see and I don't understand is supernatural. Not necessarily. Education doesn't make you smart, it only makes you educated. So while you're getting educated, Princeton, get smart at the same time. Remember, that's important. What is smart? What's the difference in smart? There's a, a big difference. If I were asked, knowing that a nuclear holocaust were coming, if I were asked, who are you going to choose as two people, you can choose anybody you want, to accompany you through this holocaust and try to survive, they'll give you a choice of one of two people, a PhD or a kid off the streets of Harlem. Harlem! right away, because that kid knows where to go for a can of peas. That kid knows where a safe place is. The PhD would get together with four other PhDs and start writing papers on it and have lots of footnotes and references and that sort of thing. I'm not knocking it. Hey, I have the greatest respect. I mean this sincerely, and I, I can't make it sincere enough. My respect for education is absolutely at the very top, 100%. Education is what is going to save us. Critical thinking given to the right people at the right time would have meant that the World Trade Center would still be standing. That's what I believe. I believe that education is the solution to so many of the problems that face us today. I have great respect for it. But don't overreach your expertise. I don't expect highly educated 
people with great IQs, lots of, of intelligence and such, I don't expect them to be able to solve magic tricks, though some of them will. I, I had a, an agreement with uh, Richard Feynman many years ago. Oh, do I miss Dick Feynman. Whoa, we had such a good thing going. I used to create brain busters for him. Oh, I was mean. I would show up in Los Angeles, call him, hey, Dick, I'm in town. Want to go to your favorite restaurant, your, the Mexican restaurant? Yeah, sure, I'll be free at noon. Come on around and get me. Okay, I'd go around. We'd go into the restaurant. I'd sit down in the restaurant, and uh, we'd sit over by the window or whatever, and we'd order up and everything, and I'd say, uh, Dick, give me the spoon out of your coffee. He'd look at me suspicious. I'd take the spoon and go, and it would fall in two pieces. He'd look at me and say, okay, you set me up? Yeah, I set you up. Point is, I had arrived two days earlier, didn't tell him. Went back out to the airport after I had visited the Mexican restaurant, set it up with the Metro D to sit at this table, put this spoon on Richard Feynman's side. Yeah, okay, here's a $5 bill. I'll give you more later. Set him up, went back to the airport, called him. Hi, Dick, I'm in town. Come to the airport and pick me up. Okay, he went out to the airport, picked me up. I had my suitcases with me. He thought I'd just arrived. Went directly to the Mexican restaurant. I set him up. I did all kinds of brain busters for him like this, and he had the agreement with me that he could ask me any question that had a yes or no answer, and I would answer honestly. Now, Richard was a physicist, but he didn't know much about astronomy. He didn't realize that the Earth rotates. He lived in California. I lived at that time in New Jersey. Two o'clock in the morning, my phone rang. Hi, Dick Feynman. Listen, if you had said to the waiter, uh, why don't you sit us over here, would it be, uh, Dick, it's two o'clock in the morning. No, it's not. It's, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You're, yeah. <laughs> See, Dick, the, the earth rotates. Yeah, 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 I know that, yeah. But would it have made any difference? Yes, it would have made a difference, Dick. Oh, but that only allows two possibilities. I'll call you back. Click. Hello, Dick. Uh, Dick, hello. Then lay awake staring at the ceiling all night waiting for the next call, you see. But it was a game we had. He never failed to solve one of them. Of course, he did have the feedback from me, honest feedback of yes or no. And that was a good game to play. It was a true or false sort of a thing and he never failed to solve one of them, and I worked my very best to come up with brain busters that would totally confound Dick Feynman. He was a different breed of person, believe me, a very special guy. Any of you who knew him will agree with me on that, I'm sure. I mentioned a moment ago the uh, business of Uri Geller, the Israeli performer who bends spoons. Now, I often wondered if he applied for a job, people would say, what is your uh, life experience, Mr. Geller? I bend spoons. Come again? I bend spoons. Oh, and people pay you for this? Oh, yeah, pay me very well. Why? Oh, I don't know. They just do. Do you ever mend spoons? No, I just <laughs> bend them. And, oh, I see. <clears throat> I don't think you're suitable for this job, Mr. Gale. But I, I just don't know, you know? If he went to meet the, 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 the uh, father of the girl that he's interested in, we'll say, uh, what a pickle, you know? I'm going to meet my dad tonight. Uh oh. How do you do, young man? What do you do for a living? I bend spoons. Oh, now, that's the end of that. You can depend on that. That is going to be the end of that romance. Well, I was called in many years ago when, in 1971, when Geller first uh, came to the United States. Uh, he had been uh, verified by a couple of laser physicists uh, at Stanford Research Institute, who to this day still swear that he was a real thing, and still is. And uh, I sat there as a magician, but I was disguised as a reporter for Time magazine. I had my big full scat pad, I was asking the right questions and such, because he had already said in advance, no magicians. I don't know why. <laughs> how, do you have any idea how that could have been? I, I really have no notion how that could have been. Well, I uh, appeared in the offices of Time magazine. He did his whole routine, and he left. And I heard screaming outside because his assistant was outside, and the secretary had said, oh, that's James Randi in there. He didn't know me, you see. Well, he knew me now. And there was all kinds of hooping and hollering outside because he'd said no magicians. Well, I explained how he had done it and called their attention to various facts, and uh, he got a very unsatisfactory write-up in Time magazine. That didn't stop him, not at all. He went on to great fame and fortune. I'm going to do a little demonstration for you. It's called Bending a Spoon. But it's rather heady. You won't get this kind of entertainment just any old place, you know. Uh, let's see. Uh, how about... Um, uh, this, uh, the, gentleman sitting right down there, okay? Would you just step over to the edge of the stage here on the second step so that, very good, the right height and everything. This is a, does it say stainless steel? Can you see what it says there? Hard to read, isn't it? Stainless spoon or something, stainless steel? I don't know. Stainless Rogers. 
Oneida or something maybe? Yeah. Oneida, that's what most of them are. We don't make them in this country anymore, I don't think. They're always made in another country. The only thing we make here is bridges, and they're hard to export. That, that other countries don't make. I, I would like you to hold on to each end of the spoon like that between your fingers, if you'd be so kind, please. Just uh, match it. And turn it a little more, to, uh, about like that, towards the audience. So, so we get a profile. I'm going to stroke on the spoon here. Aren't you glad you sat right here? I'm just going to stroke on it like this and just give it a little bit of a vibration up and down like that. Oh, look, do you see the effect? It seems, it almost looked like it turned to rubber there for a second. Look at this. It gets, look, it's all flexible. Isn't that strange? It just looks like it's bending. Look, getting all soft and rubbery. Isn't that astonishing? You're laughing, and this is science. <laughs> yeah. You can let go of it now, if you would, please, sir. I'm, I'm going to walk over to the, to the middle of the stage here and demonstrate how this works. Because the light is much better over here, obviously. Now, I'm just going to... Uh, it, it is a... Oneida, yes. Now, I'm just going to, to do this with it. You'll get the illusion that it seems to be getting rubbery, sort of limp, like cooked spaghetti. You see the effect? Very strong, isn't it? You can even just wobble it like this, and you get the effect. And some, don't laugh. This is my sincere profession. I mean, I can't do anything else. I don't tap dance. Oh. Hold your hands out like this for me, would you? Just catch it. Just catch it. There you go. All right. OK. Oh. And it's not hot even. Oh, wonderful. A miracle of a semi-religious nature. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, uh, this is a pretty dumb trick. Um, how many would like to know how that's done? <laughs> Tough. Okay. <laughs> but I'm going to do one for you now, which is... Now, you see, Mr. Geller does this by divine means. He sues me all the time, so I have to be very careful about these statements. I do this by trickery. It's absolutely impossible to tell the difference between the way I do it by trickery and he does it by divine means, you see? But I say that every time, because otherwise he will sue me. He does it by divine means. All I can tell him is if he's doing it by divine means, Uri, you doing it the hard way. <laughs> now, I'm going to do one that, uh, that he does too, but I will do it by trickery. He does this by divine means. I'd like to borrow a gentleman's wristwatch, uh, please. Uh, one with regular hands on it. Uh, no, that's uh, digital. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Pardon me. Uh, no, no disdain for... Uh, this is a, um, uh, a, it was at that time already? My goodness, it is already. Uh, this is a Casio, and it's, well, you can tell the time twice on this. It's digital down at the bottom, and it says it's Tuesday, okay, and it's uh, hands on the top, and it says, all right, now, do we have another one we can compare it with? Uh, and I can, well, I can compare it with my own, actually, because they are exactly the same time. Uh, now, it does say 1030 on your watch. Can you see it from there? Yeah. 1030. I'm going to do a little bit of a, I tell, I'm pointing 930. It's silly me. I'm getting really carried away here. I'm going to ask you to ho hold your hand out flat like that for me, please. That's it. The clean one. No, it's all right. That's the clean one. I'm going to put it in your hand like that. Put your finger on the back of it, if you would. Okay, hold it just like that. Now. Oh, I think I hurt myself. I like you. You laugh loud. How you about? Let me take a peek at it, please. No. Uh, okay. Oh, you were on concentrating. You've got to help me. Yeah. You've got to help me now. <laughs> Try to make the watch go back, you see. <laughs> oh, look. What time does it say now? It's a little bit before nine. How time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> oh, thank you. Now, my problem here is, folks, I don't know whether I put it back 30 minutes or ahead. Eleven and a half hours. Yeah, I'm not too sure. But all I know is the time is 30 minutes different from what it was a moment ago. Now, I'm going to tell you how that's done by letting you find out. Watch. I'm going to do it again from the very beginning, but I'll do it in slow motion. Okay? Here it is in slow motion so you can catch me. Watch carefully. I'll give you a little hint. I'll say, ha! Like that when I do the move, you see? Okay? So it's subtle, but you've got to pick up on it. Don't miss that. Okay? Here it is in slow motion. I would like to borrow a gentleman's wrist. Oh, well, I better not do it that slow or we'll never get out of here. Now, I took the watch from you, and the first thing I did when I took the watch from you is let it wobble like this a couple of times. That's a psychological preparation, and you get the idea. You, you don't say, oh, I see he's holding it only by the strap, but you do see that I'm holding it only by the strap. 
and I do this kind of a thing, and when I look for my watch, I bring up the middle finger of my hand here and pull out the winding stem. You notice? <laughs> but you didn't notice it before because I'm doing this, you see, indicating my watch. Then the winding stem is out, but it still says one minute to nine. Am I correct? Yes, you are. One minute to nine. Now, as I straighten up again, it's very simple just to run my finger across it like this, and now it says like 25 minutes past eight. You see, I've moved it sufficiently back. And then I simply press in the winding uh, stem like that. It's called the hack. I found that out. The hack. And I say, open your hand for me. But I keep it moving in such a way you can't see it. Open your hand. I place it in your hand like that. Hang in, hang, hang. That's it. Oh, you remembered. And I take it back and I say, oh, not yet, but that's a lie. <laughs> The psychics and the magicians do it all the time. That's a lie, you see. And I take it and put it back into your hand. You put your finger back on. Hang on, hang on again. And I say, oh, now look at what time it is. You see how easily these things are done. When you don't know what to look for, the magician can get away with it. Now that I've told you how this is done in detail, you're probably going to say to yourself, next time I see a person do that, we'll be able to catch them, right? Wrong. Gee, what time does it say on your watch now? <laughs> it's now quarter to eight. Quarter to eight. You see, while I'm standing here telling you how smart you've become, I did it all over again. <laughs> so don't depend on having a little knowledge. It is a dangerous thing. Okay. Uh, yeah, the correct time, yes, is uh, 26 minutes before 10 o'clock. Now, okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard a lot about ESP. ESP, extrasensory perf uh, perception. I was going to say perfection. Wrong. We're told that a lot of research has been done on it. A lot of research has been done on it. I think really bad research over the years. Joseph Banks Ryan and his wife, Louisa Ryan, were botanists of all things who worked for Duke University and funded by some tobacco money, uh, a great deal of it, from Doris Duke. They opened up the uh, anomalies lab out there at Duke University and uh, the Foundation for the Study of Man. And that sort of covers everything, doesn't it? It includes women too, I would hope. Now, they did research for many years. Dr. Ryan amassed a tremendous amount of data in the 30s. I had the experience one time of being shown through uh, Duke University with Stephen Camfer, who was a, an editor of Time magazine at the time, was interviewing Dr. Ryan. Dr. Ryan was hard of hearing, but he was particularly hard of hearing when you asked him an awkward question. He didn't hear it at all. I had appeared on a couple of radio shows and whenever I'd ask the, the critical questions, he suddenly went off on another tangent and uh, decided not to answer those questions. However, he was a very respectable man and I, I swear, a very honest man. I think the Ryans were very honest, but very self-deluded. Now, as we were walking through a basement corridor connecting two buildings with Steve Camfer, walking along behind Dr. Ryan, Dr. Ryan pointed to a big mass of green filing cabinets with chains going through the drawers like this. And Canfrey said, what's all this? And he said, oh, that's all the research, the late 20s and through the 30s that we did on ESP. And Canfrey said, the books are based on that. He said, no, that's when the experiments weren't working. <laughs> this is called data selecting, I believe, in the trade. It's like the tout that goes to the racetrack, comes up to you and says, I've got a sure winner. I tell you what, I'm gonna give you the winner and as soon as the horse wins, you'll split your winnings with me. Okay, then huh, what can I lose? I'm not paying the man anything. Eight horses in the race, he tells eight people, a different horse, each one. Then he remembers which one was dud in the mud. Oh, that was this guy over here, remember? I told you he had a winner, and he gets paid. That's the old racket. Well, Ryan was not doing this purposely, I don't think. I think he was basically a good researcher and a dedicated researcher, but his statistics were terrible, and we found out from examining some 16 millimeter black and white film that was in the days before video day, which would have been much cheaper and easier and more perceptive and probably better resolution than what he got, we found out that he was miscounting data too. And I think quite unconsciously. You have to give him the benefit of that. I'm going to do a little bit of an experiment here. 
There's a young lady uh, someplace in the audience. I, I didn't see where you... The, oh, there you are. Hi. I didn't get your name. I didn't ask your name. What is it? Lauren. Lauren? Yeah. Hi, Lauren. Uh, she came in with a gentleman who's seated looking like the thinker um, beside her. And uh, <laughs> I uh, stopped them when they were coming in, and I said, young lady, would you like to be part of an EISP experiment? And she said, instead of going, oh, okay, <laughs> she said, yeah, right away. And that's sort of refreshing. And I said, come to my office, but I lied. It was just a table over at the side there with some leaflets on it, right? And I gave you a magazine, and I don't uh, remember the name of the ma It was a real estate magazine of some kind, but it was pretty, had a hundred and more pages in it, didn't it? Yeah. yeah, okay. And I asked her to name any page in there, turn to that page, and as long as it had a lot of type on it, I asked her to, well, I stepped, I was a good 20 feet away, right? With my back turned, and I said, uh, just run your finger around and stop any place at all. If you stop in the middle of a photograph, do it again and come to a stop someplace. And you did that, and you chose a word by that. I mean, I've got to ask you the critical question now. Do you remember the word? Yes. Oh, good. I really hate when you have the flamingo come in on the string, you know, with the, with the card and its beak or something like that and say, is that your card? People say, I don't know, I forgot. Boy, I hate that. <laughs> so you do remember it. I asked you at that point to tear the entire page out of the magazine, fold it up, put it in your pocket. Did you tell him? Okay, are you sure? Let me look right straight in your eyes. Okay, I got it. I, I believe you didn't tell anyone that. So you should be the only person who knows what word you settled on and that you're thinking. You're thinking of that in your mind right now, right? Okay, I'm going to step over to the board and I'm not going to look at you. And the reason I don't look at you, Lauren, is because if I'm right, you'll be going like that, see? And if I'm wrong, you'll be going. <laughs> okay. That's called body language, and I don't want to give it away with body language. So I'll just step over to the board here. And, uh, oh boy, I'm just going to start to, to draw here. Uh, hmm. hmm. I don't, no, I'm not getting what this is at all. No, sorry. That's, ah, yeah. Yeah, I have no idea what that means. No. What I, I, I admit that this may not work too well. What was the year that uh, the, the year that you were thinking of? The word you were thinking of? It was here. Oh, you see, you must have put it in your pocket, upside down. Am I correct? There you go. One more, one more. They, they gave me a couple of books here. These are obviously well-read people. I said no catalogs and no dictionaries and no scientific books, particularly physics, because it's got lambdas in it and uh, omegas and stuff like that, and Greek stuff. I don't understand any of that. Uh, they gave me King, sort of a ratty edition, hmm. King Arthur and his knights based on Mort d'Arthur, whatever that means, of Sir Thomas Mallory, okay, and no... No pictures. No drat. Well, uh, King Arthur and his knights and Homer, the Odyssey. Uh, who was Homer? Oh, naked statues. Look. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> okay. Oh, good. Not very good illustration. And there's a big ink stain on this one, too. Jeez. They didn't give me very, any library cards in the back? No, okay. <laughs> um, we'll do an experiment with uh, how about uh, this young lady sitting right here. Uh, which book would you like to use? The blue one? The Odyssey. Okay, can you catch it? All right. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Okay. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is very simple. I'll illustrate with this book here, if you'd be so kind. Just do this. Hold the book up, first of all, like that, so I can't see if you hold it like this. I can look and see who <laughs> sneaky me. I want you to hold it up like this, if you would, and open up at any page at all. If you don't like that page, go on a few pages or back a few pages, and you'll find one you like. You got one you like? Oh, she's going to be fussy, fussy. And you're... Okay, you got one now? Okay. Now, what I want you to take the page number, is it at the top or the bottom? At the bottom. Okay, it's at the top in this one. Add together the digits of the page number. Uh, if it's uh, page 122, for example, that would be five, you see. Uh, you've got a smaller number that way, right? Okay, count over from the first word on the page. Count over that number of words, whatever that smaller number is. If you saw on page 120, she'd have to count 120 words. You know, we wouldn't want that. You got that word now? Okay, close the book and uh, toss it up to me so I can get the vibrations. 
Hiya! There he goes. Well, close enough for government work, yes, okay. Uh, I get the button. Ah, oh, I got the vibrations, okay. Now you remember the word at that particular position. Um, now that's about as good a randomizing thing we can come up with. We'd had a book of randomized, random numbers or something like that, or a calculator, we go through a whole thing, but that would be science, and I don't want to get too involved in that. Um, okay, think of the word now. Uh, whoa, I'm just going to, oh, they stuck it down, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm going to, uh, if it's an action that you can think of, like putting a ladder up against the wall or something, picture the action. If it's a, an object like a cloud or a, a sword or something like that, which wouldn't be unlikely in Homer, think of what that looks like. Uh, Hmm. Well, I'm not much of an artist, so don't uh, try to not to make it too complicated. But if it's a uh, an embellishment there, couldn't hurt. Picasso did this and made a fortune. Okay, you looked at one word in a book, which you chose a page quite freely, right? Any old page at all. And uh, we, by random means, we selected one word on that page. What was the word that you looked at, please? Sorry? Oh, like that? Okay. Okay. Now let me explain, folks. What you're seeing here is a demonstration of what we call mentalism. It appears to be done with the mind. It's tricks. I don't know this lady. I didn't know this pe these people over here. These are not stooges. These are not people that agree to do these things in advance, except as far as Lauren and I, I, I told you what happened out in the lobby there, and that was quite true. But she's not my confederate in any way. And a lot of people say, well, that's the only solution. No, it isn't. There are other ways that these things can be done. Now, I... As I said when I began here, I'm very honored to be a, have been asked to Princeton tonight. And there are many reasons that it's such a distinct honor. First of all, the name Princeton alone. I've been to Yale, been to Cornell, I've been to Dartmouth, I've been to all of the great colleges around the world, essentially. Uh, uh, Oxford in England and uh, Cambridge in England. Uh, Cardiff, Liverpool, gee, just about every place. And what I find in all these learned communities is a hunger for knowledge. It's got to be here. You aren't in university if you don't have a hunger for knowledge. A hunger to improve yourself, to sharpen your, your critical skills, and part of those skills are critical thinking. You must not depend on authority for everything that you learn. Learning something out of a book or from an authority who says this is the way it is that is not getting an education. What is getting an education is what happened to me, luckily. I only went through high school. I never went to college. You see, when I walk into these halls, I get a feeling of, damn, I never did this, did I? But I am lecturing at these places. And that's, that's quite a privilege for me because I'm essentially an uneducated person. Went through high school, had some teachers in high school that were brilliant. I dedicated my first book, Flim Flam, to Mr. Tavell, long since dead. I'll tell you very quickly a, a very funny story about Tavell. My good friend Gary Haynes in Canada, when I went up there one time, he said, you know, Mr. Tavell is in his 90s. He's still alive. And I said, oh, we've got to visit him. He said, yes, I told him you were coming. We'll go and visit him. He was our physics teacher. So we went over to see Mr. Tavell. And Gary's son had made a, a profession, a choice of profession. And so Tavell said, Gary, he said, I didn't ask you about your son. And Tavell's in a wheelchair now with a cane and the whole thing, but still sharp as a tack. He said to Gary, what has he decided that he wants to be? And Gary told him. And Tavell turned in astonishment and his eyes blazed and he raised his cane. And he said, I thought I taught you better than that. Why would you encourage him to go into that profession? And I stepped over to Dr. Tavell and I said, no, doctor. He said, parasitologist. And he said, oh, well, that's okay. 
he thought that he had said parapsychologist, and he was justly incensed over that. So Tavell was no longer with us, but he's here. He taught me how to do science. He taught me very well what science is really all about. He taught me that you've got to be extremely critical of your own process of thought, that you cannot data search, that you've got to do everything double blind, that you've got to have control groups and such. And we did damn good experiments for high school people in Canada. We really did. And I learned a lot about science. Well, I am right in a center of learning right now. And I'm a little bit awed by the whole experience. I, I admit that. Because you folks, if you're students here, or if you're graduates, or if you're people that have degrees and such, you have something that I will never have. I don't have that on paper, no. But I do have a great deal of experience in the world, and that's the thing that I came to share with you tonight. My experience of the real world out there and how it actually operates. It's somewhat different from what happens behind the walls of academe. I'm going to close this lecture as I used to close my magic shows as well. With a little bit of a or a discussion I think that you may find interesting and perhaps even amusing. No Virginia, there's no Santa Claus. Oh, bummer. What am I doing saying there's no Santa Claus? That's a pleasant notion. Let kids have that notion. Oh, sure, well, I do. Of course I do, up to a certain age. Once you reach 18, I think you should get over that. <laughs> no Virginia, there's no Santa Claus, but I answered that very glibly and very quickly. And yet I realize, oh yes, but there are a lot of things I don't understand. See, in my office in Florida, I have a big vine that grows up outside. I have my office in Florida, I have my office in my home. And I start out in my home, I'm up by 6.30 or so, and I'm usually showered in shade. Shade? What? <laughs> by 7 o'clock, and I make myself a cup of coffee, and I plunk it down in front of my computer just to start to catch up on the day before I head off for the office. And I look up at the window, and there's this morning glory vine. Do you know that morning glory flowers close up at night? Like this. And in the morning, they open up again. How do they know? How do they do it? I'm sure some botanists have written a paper on it someplace with millions of footnotes and references and whatnot, and it's figured out. It's probably a hydraulic pressure or something that it pumps on. It does it. I don't know. I really don't know. Maybe I don't know how it does it. But there's probably an explanation, but I don't know what that explanation is, and I try to catch them. I try to catch them. I sit there, I say, uh huh. Still closed up, eh? Okay. Start the computer. Why the hell do they put the button way around at the back? There we go. And the printer. Way around the back. Click there. Is there paper in there? Yeah, there's paper in there. Okay. I'm gonna catch him. Word perfect. Okay, click the key. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hard disk is buzzing away. I'm taking my eyes off you. The coffee is right here. There we go. Okay. I'm going to take. Where's the damn saucer? Okay. Got it? Okay. I'm going to catch you. Got that thing here. Okay, is there enough paper? Ah! <laughs> there they are. Like this, looking at me. I never catch them. What do they do? They turn to one another and say, Is he looking? And they're not looking at him. Kind of thing. I don't know. It's one of the mysteries of my life. I also have a lot of fantasies going on for myself. See, 11 miles away is one of Sophia Loren's homes. <laughs> I think you can see the rest of it. I have a fantasy that some dark, stormy night, lightning coming down, boom, with the thunder and the whole thing. I'm watching TV, and it's 1 o'clock in the morning. Whoa, got to get to work in the morning. So I switch off the TV, and I head for the stairs, and I hear on the door. Who could that be at one o'clock in the morning? I go to the door, throw it open, and there is Sophia standing there dripping wet with an overnight back in her hand saying, I have no place to go. <laughs> this shows you how rich my fantasy life is, folks. Don't tell Sophia. Please don't tell Sophia. She probably doesn't know a thing about this. You could maybe write her a note or something like that. So I have a rich fantasy life going for me. But wait a minute, this thing with the morning glories and such. So where is all the magic? And such? Oh, there's lots of magic. Hold up a puppy dog. Take a look at a newborn baby that doesn't know anything yet, but is looking around wildly to drink in as much as he or she can to learn something about this wonderful world. That may be a president of the United States. It may be a famous physicist or a doctor. We don't know. It's just an unformed child. 
barely emerged into this world. Isn't that exciting? Go out and see, as Charles Lawton once said, that, that field of daffodils outside the, the, uh, the Parliament buildings in Toronto. Oh, that's a sight if you've never seen it. Oh, there are wonderful things to see. So there are beautiful things out there. And I'm not an old curmudgeon who sits there saying, this isn't so and this isn't so. Oh, I found something else that isn't so and puts it on my web page. No, I'm willing to be shown miracles. But I get people often in my audiences that say, can you prove to me, Mr. Randy, that ESP doesn't exist? And I say, oh, no. They say, aha, I never mind aha. I didn't say that it didn't exist. All I say is that the proof is not sufficient. You say it does exist? Yes, I know it exists. Prove it. That's all. I'm just asking them to prove it. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist. Now, proving a negative is very difficult. I'll give you a quick example of Santa Claus. Oh, I'm very popular at the end of December, I can assure you of that. <laughs> not on the 26th. They kicked me in the ankle because they didn't get the pony, you know. But I do the best I can for the earlier part of the month. Now, suppose I get into the Santa Claus thing and I decide to investigate that scientifically with lots of advisors. We could take one aspect of it, flying reindeer, that'll do. I mean, the whole thing, you know, the chimney and everything, that's, that's a different matter. How about flying reindeer? Experiment. Take 100 reindeer up on top of the uh, whole World Trade Center. Would do it? Getting the idea? On top of the World Trade Center. Isn't that incredible? That I should be able to stand here and launch into that story almost on automatic and have forgotten what happened on September the 11th. I apologize for that. I'm very sorry. I came out with that automatically because just for a moment, perhaps a blissful moment, I forgot what happened on September the 11th. Never mind the World Trade Center. Let's go to the Empire State Building. Forgive me. Forgive me for that slip. I'm very sorry. I apologize profusely. Top of the World Trade Center is the way I used to say it. Now we say on top of the Empire State Building. Let's experiment. First reindeer. Fly. Ooh. <laughs> right down on the pad there, no for number one. <laughs> number two, step forward. Now what's going to happen, folks? Based upon my admittedly meager knowledge of the aerodynamics of reindeer, I think we're going to get a pile of very unhappy and broken reindeer down on the street. And probably a couple of New York cops standing there saying, I don't know either, but here comes another one. <laughs> I'm an experimenter, and I'm willing to do that experiment. But have I proven that reindeer cannot fly? No, I haven't proven that. I've only shown that these hundred reindeer either could not fly or chose not to. <laughs> if the latter, we know something about the IQ of the average reindeer. I'm willing to be shown. I am willing to be shown, but at the same time, I bear in mind that these parapsychologists and the spooky artists, the guys with the earrings and the, the, the funny hats and the horoscope on the wall behind them and such, these are the people we've really got to fear. They are telling us to go back into the caves that our ancestors came from. They're not saying, go on beyond that. We've been to the moon. Now, I don't know anybody in this place that's been to the moon, but I met a couple of people who have. At the Houston Face Flight Center, they put me in a funny bunny suit and gloves and the whole thing, and I went into this room, and I handled pieces of the moon. Folks, I had pieces of the moon, Luna, in my hand. They allowed me to handle them, and we went there and we got them. Aren't we remarkable? Aren't we remarkable that we shot up into space, went to the moon, grabbed pieces of the rocks, and came back, and we can put them in a museum today? Because I know I can go to major museums any place in the world. Walk up to the guard at the door, say, good morning, sir. Where is your moon rock? And he'll look at the detainee. He said, that's on the fourth floor in gallery F. And I go up to the fourth floor, gallery F, walk in. There is a piece of the moon. And under plastic, I can look at it and see a piece of the moon. Damn, isn't that enough thrill? Do I need the ghosts and goblins and John Edward talking with spirits and such? Do I need crystal balls and tarot card readings? No. We've done some absolutely remarkable stuff. Let's continue to do them. And Carl Sagan. Damn, there's another man I miss. Carl Sagan once said, we are made of star stuff. And by that, he simply meant that the heavier elements that we're made of were ones, hydrogen and whatnot, lighter things on stars in the middle of hot galaxy and everything. And it all got cooler. And we developed these elements. And hey, this, this, all around us, this whole thing, this is star stuff. 
Yes, we're made of star stuff. We've been to the moon. I'm sure we're going to Mars. Not in my generation, no. Not in your generation, perhaps not for a couple more. But we will go to Mars eventually. And that's the wonderful thing about us. We can do things like that. But not if we go in back into the dark ages again and start to believe in superstitions and nonsense and pseudoscience. No, we can go on. And Carl, I hear you. We can go to the stars. I decided when I was 10 years of age that I wasn't going to go for any of this crap. All of this nonsense, this pseudoscience and superstition. I made up my mind that I wanted to go to the stars. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you. Will you join me? I hope so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, folks, um, if some of you can stay and some of you have to get away, I understand that. Uh, do we have time enough where we can ask some questions and answer some questions? If you have questions, again, this is not holding your hand up. This is holding your hand up. And if you have to leave, we certainly understand and we thank you for being here. Yes, sir. How do you do that? How did I do that? How many want to know how that's done? Tough again. There you go. <laughs> I did it very well and with great dedication. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. I don't tell you how these tricks are done because they're usually very simple solutions. And you say, oh, yeah, I never thought of that. And you think, oh, yeah, I would have thought of that eventually. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> You've got to recognize that you can be deceived, too. It's not unlettered, uneducated, uh, ignorant, stupid, unsophisticated people. No, it's people like you and me. We can be fooled. We, I can be fooled, too. Hey, I see some stuff that magicians do sometimes, and guys like Jamie and Swiss and a few other guys will blow me away. And I sit there, whoa, you couldn't have done that, Jamie. And he looks at me and says, oh, yes, I did, smarty. And that's the end of that. Oh, we eventually share these secrets, as you probably suspect. But no, we can all be fooled. Don't ever think you can't be fooled. I don't want to hear that. Other questions that we can ask? Yes, sir, the gentleman back here. I'm sorry? Would I use a rigged book? Did you hear that? Next question. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, he wasn't the police chief. He was the guy that worked. She got it all wrong. Didn't she notice what? No, apparently not. And the funny, uh, the, while you're on that subject, you know, the interesting thing is that John Edward appeared on the Larry King Show less than 12 hours before the World Trade Center fell. And he didn't warn us. Apparently, he didn't know. How could that be? He's in touch with millions of departed souls out there. They must know something we don't know. Wouldn't you think that? No, uh, Sylvia Brown uh, got uh, Stephen Xanthos, who was a policeman in a different police force, and had retired years before. She says you're working on a case with him. And if that's true, he's going to be under arrest very shortly because he lost his license many years ago. So that sort of handles that subject. Uh, yes, sir. In a religion, there is an M word called miracle. Yes. And uh, would you comment on that? Well, a miracle by definition, dictionary definition and other definitions I've heard, is supposed to be something that truly does occur which has no possible explanation in science or in reason or anything like that, any process of that. Uh, show me. I hear them all the time. We hear stories about this thing. But if I can be shown, that's the million dollars one right away. They win it. It's, it's that simple. You know, we don't seem to be around when these things happen. But uh, we hear them all the time. The Shroud of Turin was a miracle at one time. Then they found out that it dated by the 13th century. Now they're saying the carbon dating process is no good on shrouds. That's what they say. That's what the believers say, because they not only want it to be true, they need it to be true. Miracles, uh, yes, I'm willing to be shown, but you've got to show me. I'm not from Missouri. I'm from Canada, but still, you know. Uh, other questions? Uh, we had... Where are we? Back there. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, that's on the, on the preliminary test only. You can see, I would do anything to get her into the formal test. <laughs> then we'd really have the evidence. 
you see. That's just a, a, it's a temptation. It's a little carrot I'm holding toward. She won't bite even for that carrot. If it was a chocolate eclair, maybe, I don't know. But uh, no, Sylvia is, uh, I'm giving her the advantage where the odds are about 50 to 1 instead of 1,000 to 1 because I want her desperately to accept the preliminary, which I'm sure she'll fail anyway. I mean, I've got one chance in 50 of, uh, of losing, but uh, that wouldn't win the million dollars. That's only the preliminary test, and I stated that very carefully. I was very careful about that. I want to get Sylvia on the grill. You bet. I don't think she's ever going to accept. She's got to start making excuses now as to why she can't be tested. Headache, uh, you know, the uh, Sagittarius, uh, Jupiter's in Sagittarius, something's going to, bad pork chop, it's going to be anything. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Yes. investigation claims the fair no. Yeah, uh, the James Randi Educational Foundation, um, we have a lot of affiliations, including with, with PSYCOP, in that we share knowledge with them and we share expertise back and forth. We're always exchanging uh, ideas and information. I often get called by uh, the different organizations, uh, uh, such as uh, our local group here, uh, the FACT group, and um, we share information on that. We're uh, uh, really very generous for that because only by sharing information like that will we learn anything. Often there's expertise like uh, I need statisticians, for example. I, I need chemists in some cases. I need uh, uh, people in uh, mental hygiene in some cases and, and in regular medicine. Uh, I, I need a lot of expertise like that because I don't have it myself and I don't have it always available to me. But I have a lot of expertise that I can share with others too. There are organizations like this all over the world. As a matter of fact, the million dollar prize that we offer is closer to two and a half million. If you add together all the prizes from all over the world, a very substantial prize in Germany, and one in France, and one in England as well, and one in Australia. So uh, there's a lot more prize money than just the one million dollars of the James Randi Educational Foundation to be won. Well, we try to cooperate. I dropped out of PSYCOP some years ago because they decided they were never going to mention the name Uri Geller again because he was suing them. And I just simply said, gentlemen, that's what we set up in business to do. So I'm sorry I can't be associated any longer, and uh, I had to resign. Uh, it was my own decision to make. Yes, right behind. Mm -hmm. And it would just bend up. Wrong. <laughs> no. People said they saw that, but we've got no evidence of that happening at all. No evidence whatsoever. They now make for the magician. Do you know about the fork that Stevens uh, Magic is? Oh, it costs 700 bucks. Uh, it's a fork that you can literally get handed out for examination. The examiner, you put it on a table, any place on the floor, and for the next five minutes, you watch it, and it curls right up like this into a hump like that. You can examine it before and after. It's made out of a special alloy and you have to keep it on dry ice backstage until you're ready to use it, and then you bring it out and you just stroke it to take the, the chill off it like that, and you can offer it. it. It's a remarkable thing. Have you seen it? It doesn't look like a very good fork, but it's close enough for government work. No. Uh, you know, IHOP maybe, but not uh, Sardis or something like that. But it, uh, it will do that. But Geller, is, uh, they've always said about Geller that he did these things, but then when you go for the evidence, I, he, I think it was someplace in England, or was it France? I've forgotten. They can never give you the place where it actually happened. So uh, I believe that to be sort of part of the mythology. I heard a lot of, oh, I heard, used to hear things about things that I, as a magician, did. Oh, one, one TV producer for NBC told his friend, while I'm sitting at the table, he said, oh, we did a great thing with Randy at the Shelton Hotel pool. We put him in a pair of handcuffs, then we put him in a straitjacket, we threw him in the pool. <laughs> I'm saying, uh, uh, Dave, I, I don't think so, Dave. And he said, why not? Well, first of all, you put handcuffs on a guy, you can't then put him in a straitjacket, which put you know, like this. He said, well, all I remember is that's what we did. I said, no, you didn't throw me in the pool. You put me in a coffin and held me underwater for two hours and two minutes. He said, yeah, I remember that one too, but we, I remember you threw you in the pool. No, you didn't throw me in the pool. But uh, people have a tendency to, once they tell this story a certain number of times, they believe that it's true, you see. For all I know, Mr. Geller may believe it's true. <laughs> yeah, right. Other questions? That, uh, yes, in the back right here on the aisle. Yeah. Yeah. We're trying to do something about it. Elizabeth uh, Targ, by the way, or uh, Targ, pardon me, 
is the daughter of uh, one of the two scientists that brought Harry Geller to this country. So that gives her uh, the hierarchy of the thing, more or less. Um, and she is getting substantial funding from very large corporations and government funding as well to do prayer sessions where they pray, about, they pray for people who don't know they're being prayed for. And uh, I think this is, for, for government money certainly, this is a very, very bad investment. And it's my money they're spending, and your money too. And I really want to do something about that. I have time for one more demonstration, which I would like to do for you if you have the patience to see the people, the weak need people, they already left, see. <laughs> see. They're the wimps, you see. But I would like to do a demonstration for you to demonstrate how spiritualists used to get their effects. Now, spiritualists during the 1920s and 30s were very popular, and Houdini fought them. He died in 1926, and up until that date, he fought them tooth and nail, particularly the last part of his life, because they would always call back the ghost of his mother, and she spoke perfect English when she only spoke Yiddish all of her life, never knew a word of English. And they said, oh, well, in heaven, everyone speaks English, which is reassuring. <laughs> And that made him very angry, and he used to do demonstrations, not quite like this, but almost like this. I would like to invite two big, strong gentlemen, the bigger and better, uh, the, on the stage to come and do a little demonstration with me here. Uh, do you have a couple of gentlemen that would like to volunteer to come up here? People that I don't know, uh, of course. Uh, come on. I, oh, there's one right there. Yeah, come on. You don't have that. Yeah, right there. If you want to come, sir. Yeah, sure. Climb up the stage, either end, we'll do, or right in the middle if you're going to be real macho about it. There you go. Hi. <laughs> what is your name? True. That's true. Okay. And your name? Uh, you can stand over at this side if you would, sir. Now, do either one of you happen to have a piece of rope about that long, maybe? No? No. Well, by a strange and somewhat contrived coincidence, I do. Now, this is a piece of what they call sash cord. Would you hold on to that end, sir? That's your end. Would you hold on to this end? That's your end. I want you to pull on it very tightly to make sure it's good and strong. Is it good and strong? Okay, let me see. Yes, very strong. Okay. I'm going to remove my wristwatch and put it away in a safe place. It's a value judgment I have to make. See, let go of the rope now. It's mine after all. Now, I'm going to ask these two gentlemen, using this simple piece of rope, to tie my hands together, one on top of the other like that, in such a way that I shouldn't be able to remove it or free myself. Right? Right. Wrong, because there's a trap door right there. You press the button, and you know, away he goes. Okay. Now, grab your end of the rope again, please, sir. There is your end right there. Making a knot. Grab your end, sir. Pull on it very tightly. Whoa, the pain. That's fine. I'll bring my hand around on top. Tie the other hand on top, if you would, please. Don't catch the suit, and if you tear the suit, I'll have to buy it. Okay, tear on it. Come on, really pull on it now. That's it. Tie another knot on top of that. Whoa. Another knot. And if you have enough rope, you can tie a third knot if you want. Is there enough rope? Yeah. Damn. Okay. <laughs> Tie one more knot on top of it then. Okay, you got it now? Yes. Okay, is that knot really tight now? It's a triple knot. Well, should be good and tight. There you go. Okay, now I need, uh, oh, that chair over there. Would you get that chair for me, sir, please? Bring it right over here on the stage. <laughs> yeah, right here. Okay. You turned it around, sir. So Okay, now. Oh, the rope seems to have fallen off. Now, wait a minute. Wait, wait. We're only beginning to get started here. Uh, you've got a... Uh, would you slip off that jacket just for a second for me, please? Uh, clean shirt? I'm glad to see that. Okay, now, I'm going to sit down in this chair, and we're going to do this all over again. This time, I'll be seated. Look at that crowd in the doorway. Is that the ones with the pitchforks and the torches? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to pass the rope underneath the legs. Come closer. I never bite a spectator. Well, seldom. Hold on to your end again, please. Hold on to your end. That's it. Pull on it very tightly now. Right down that. And bring it up on top and make a knot. Don't tie the thumbs. Those are the pink ones. Okay. Pull on it now. That's it. Put your finger in the knot. Tie another knot on top of that one. Whoa. I got the right guys. Or the wrong guys. One way or the other. I didn't give you too much rope, did I? I'm no fool. <laughs> okay. Ah, okay. That's pretty good. Your shoes don't fall off before noon, do they? <laughs> okay. Okay, pull on it. Tighty. Very good. Oh, okay. Whoa. <laughs> you can see the hands are a little tight. Okay, would you uh, take your jacket there, please? And when I say go, not just yet, I let the folks over there see you. That's it. Didn't want to cheat you. Okay. Now, when I say go, just bring the 
the jacket around so as to cover my hands and up to my elbows on this side. Ready? Okay, wait a minute, left over, right, right. Okay, I think we can do that. Okay, bring it around. That's it, just cover up the hands and, no, 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 stand, you got the people there. Oh, okay. No, you didn't get the idea. No. Take it off again, take it off. Take it off. That's it. Let's try this again. Let's try it one more time. One more time. Where did, it, where did it go? Oh, there you go. All right. Just bring it around on the top. You get the idea, I think, ladies and gentlemen. How about a big round of applause for the two gentlemen who came up to help me? You get your shirt back. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Oh, uh, well. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank Princeton. I want to thank each and every one of you individuals. You've been a wonderful audience for me this evening. I just hope that somewhere along the line, I've gotten the message across. Think about these things. Don't accept them because you're told them endlessly. Think, do critical thinking, and support us by getting in our webpage, taking a look at how you can help us out. www.randy.org. I invite you to take a look. I think you'll find it entertaining. Thank you, Princeton. Thank you very much. Good night. Oh!